so here we are today, and today we're talking about prayer. And the reason why we're talking about prayer is because somebody said to me, eh, what about this thing, prayer anyway? And so I thought, well, maybe it's time to revisit this thing called prayer anyway <laughs> and, and see what that's all about. And as you know, usually prayer is seen within the context of a religion or a faith or a spirituality. Those words mean all the same thing to me. And for me, religion simply means a relationship with something higher than ourselves, something greater than ourselves, something more than ourselves, something infinitely more expansive than we ourselves are. And that's what religion is is about a relationship. A religion is a relationship. And so prayer is contained within the context of that. But you know, a religion or a faith or a spirituality is not something that we pick up and put down now and again here and there or we visit every now and again when we feel the need for it. It's not that at all. It's not that um, set body of rules and regulations and, and, and principles and doctrines and dogmas that have been handed down to us like as a finished or a complete or a custom-made set of rubrics for us to, you know, go to every now and again when we have the need for whatever reason. A religion is not something I'm going to learn by rote and uh, a parrot fashion so that I can, you know, uh, quote great big gobs from um, the various and sundry uh, holy books so that I come across as rather knowledgeable and so on and so forth or maybe uh, get some kind of an answer from when I have a question about life and living. That's not what religion is merely only at all. And then within that you have to see the context of this thing called prayer. Now prayer is the same thing. It's handed down to us. We learn it uh, when we're knee-high to a grasshopper and we go about the business of doing what everybody else does when it comes to prayer. And for me, 200 years ago, growing up in Ireland, uh, you know, prayer was learning words by rote. They were um, m many different types of prayer, and you said your prayers. You said your prayers. And uh, in the catechism, we all went to catechism classes, and uh, we learned our catechism answers to our questions, and I was very good at catechism. I can remember my catechism to this day. So one of the questions was, what is prayer? And the answer was, prayer is the raising of the mind and the heart to God, to adore and praise him, to thank him for his favors. Well, that's an okay definition. I can't see any flaw in that, it's apart from the him, because we know that God is more than him. God contains the fullness and the allness of experience and, uh, and uh, uh, life. Um, and then when the next question following that was, well, when should we pray? And the answer to that was, we should pray very often often, especially in the morning and in the evening, at all times, but especially during temptation. Well, I didn't find anything, you know, untoward than that. That sounds like a reasonable thing to do, especially in times of temptation, which was always stressed to us because we're always told we were always in occasions of sin and surrounded by temptation. Wicked kids that we were. Anyway. <laughs> So we needed to keep ourselves prayed up. And then the next question was, well, how should we pray? And the answer to that was, we should pray with a humble and a contrite heart, with, a, with, with absolute confidence in God's goodness and with resignation to God's will. Well, again, I couldn't find anything in that that I couldn't wrap my mind around, and that sounded okay to me, especially now when I understand that God's will for me, which wasn't stressed 200 years ago in Ireland, that God's will for me was that I should have life and have it in abundance and that my joy should be complete, and that was the only will God had for me. No, we came up with a whole other concept of God's will for us. <laughs> God's will for us was that we should suffer in silence, that we should offer it up, that we should bear our cross and our reward in heaven would be super and great and grand. That's what we understood God's will to be. So consequently, when it came to the Our Father and the recitation of the Our Father, when it said, thy will be done, I used to mumble away past that. Because I wasn't sure whether I wanted God's will to be done in me, by me, and through me, and as me. I don't think I wanted to embrace all that suffering and offering it all up and everything else. So it, was, it wasn't a happy line in that prayer. It was kind of very challenging. And uh, so, of course, thankfully, later on, I came to understand what prayer is for myself. I discovered what that is for myself. And what I have discovered with regard to prayer is that prayer is the life that I'm living. 
Prayer is an attitude of mind and heart. Prayer is a way of life. Prayer is an affirmative response to life. So prayer is simply how I am, who I am, and the way I am, how I show up. That's prayer. So it touches every aspect of my life and living. And as I state, it is my way of being. So consequently, now I know that um, spiritual people are not necessarily people who say prayers. Just because I say prayers doesn't mean I'm prayerful at all, by any manner or means. Um, and I understand that I don't use prayer formula, the formulae, so many of those prayers, as, as magic or as um, in a superstitious way or anything like that. Now I'm in my own prayer because I'm in my own self and my own state of being. And so when I show up consciously in prayer, it's me to show up as my essential self, as my essential nature, as my best self, uh, at at one moment, uh, unified and integrated with life and living. Because what prayer does for us is to take us into that awareness that life, all of it, me included, all of it is interwoven, interdependent, integrated uh, into one great big whole fabric of being. And I am an essential aspect of that. And all of that is an essential aspect of me. So it's a very big, full, amazing uh, realization and concept. It's very vast. And so I have to know then that uh, when I am ready to be that prayer life that I am, because prayer is simply amazing grace in operation, consciously happening. That's what prayer is. It's just amazing grace showing up and expressing itself in and through and by means of my life. Or in other words, it's simply infinite intelligence being expressed through me. However you want to see that. Or the sweetness of God showing up by means of me. Whatever your language is for all of that. And we all have different language at different times. So, and understand of course, no matter what you say it is, it's not that, it's more. Because this is, we're talking about that which is nameless here. That which is nameless. And see, whether you're talking about God or prayer or spirituality or your own life, you're talking about the one thing. Because there is only one thing. Life. Living itself by means of all of its creation. You included, me included. And it's never going to change. It's always going to be that. Now, I can either go through my life understanding some of that or being totally oblivious to it. Now, if I'm oblivious to it, I'm going to have some trials and tribulations and some hard, uh, you know, mountains to climb. If I'm aware of it, I can do those things with grace and ease because I know I'm not alone and I'm not just by myself, but I am accompanied. And that which accompanies me is not to the side of me, it's within me. It's right within me, closer, closer than breathing and nearer than my hands and feet said Thomas Aquinas. That's how close that is, that prayer-filled energy, that energy which is prayer, that prayer which is amazing grace, amazing grace which is the spirit of life itself, uh, and right where I am, regardless of how I am. And there's the rub. And it's difficult at times to challenge yourself to get your, your spiritual arms around that, because no matter how debauched I am, Nevertheless, that power and that presence is filling me. It's brilliant within me. In me. It's potent within me. It's powerful within me. It's infinite within me. And I cannot diminish that in any way, regardless of how I botch everything up or not, as the case may be. And the beauty of it is that at any moment I can wake up and say, you know what, I'm not my debauchery. I'm not my mistakes. I am not my bad behavior. I am so much more than that. And the moment I can move into that, the more I become unified with that and all of that stuff goes away. Goes away, is obliterated, diminished, it's as if it never was. 
And that's the beauty of being prayer filled because it does keep us in that unified transcendent state of being. And what do those words mean? Simply means that it keeps you above the fray. It keeps your head above water. It keeps you understanding that you may be in an experience, you may be having a condition or whatever, but that's not the truth of your being. And that is temporary and it's passing if you would let it to pass. So, what are the conditions of prayer? Because there are conditions of prayer. Well, according to the great master teacher, the great master lover, Jesus, he says that the conditions for prayer are as follows. Love the almighty good God, infinite being. Love your neighbor and love yourself. You see, love is the matrix for prayer. Love is the matrix for prayer. So there, there are the conditions for your prayer to be fulfilled. Love God, love your neighbor, love yourself. And another big mighty one attached to that is forgiveness. There is no realization of unified being or transcendence without forgiveness. So sooner or later along the trajectory of our lives, our eternal lives, we've got to get good with this uh, thing called forgiveness. Because there's no love without forgiveness and there's no forgiveness without love. They're hand in hand, glove in glove. And so forgiveness simply means I have to be able to let go of all of the junk, the spiritual junk I'm carrying around with me. And that would include, oh, I don't have enough breath to say what that includes, but, you know, <laughs> envy, jealousy, hatred, bitterness, grousing, grumbling, complaining. It has to do with all of the negatives within our lives. That's what that means. Letting go of that. Letting go of all of that so love can show up by means of you and you can be who you are in truth. Love personified as you. Because that's your nature. So love is the essence that I live in, I move in, I have my being in. And isn't it interesting, although I live, move, and have my being in love, I can be so loveless. <laughs> isn't that amazing? I can be what I'm not. I have the power to be what I am not in truth. I have the power to be the greatest pretender of all. To identify myself with something that I am not. That doesn't even exist. And yet I can do it. That's the power of my mind. That's the power of my decision. That's the power of my intention. That's the power of my choice. I can be, I can choose to be what I am not. And every time you and I are going around with an ailment, we're choosing to be what we are not. So the first step in prayer is not one that you've been stressed uh, or you've heard stressed here before. It's to relax, release, and let go of because there is a way we're supposed to show up in prayer. Ernest Holmes says, how are you supposed to show up in prayer? And his answer is, sanely. <laughs> it's the first word he says, sanely. Now that doesn't mean on your last nerve, fragmented, all over the place, on a roller coaster of emotion. Before you can enter into this thing called life, this thing called life, this thing called unified being, prayer, there has to be a certain set of conditions in place and a certain attitude and frame of mind and being. So we have to show up peacefully, calmly, openly, receptive to great good. For that to happen, we have to calm and quieten the ego, you know that. Calm and quieten the body. For that to be able to be the springboard for us into the truth that we're wishing to discover, unravel, unfold, express, and experience in our minds, bodies, hearts, and soul. Okay. So to release that, we have to let go of all of that gunk, all of the negativity, before we can realize in prayer what we want to realize in prayer. And remember, prayer is not what you do. It's nothing that you do. In prayer, we don't do anything except we allow in prayer, we allow. There's nothing to do. We simply allow the good that already is, the health that already is, the abundance that already is, the relationships that already are, the creative expression that's already available to us to flow through us. That's what we do in prayer. We relax, we release, and we let go of the outer realm and all of its nonsense, and we go into the essential nature of our own 
being. There's no God out there going to do anything for you, nothing whatsoever. The only God that's going to do anything for you is the God in here that's working in you and through you by means of you as you, that has your cooperation in consciousness, in thinking, and in feeling, and in conviction. So, we show up sanely. We do what it takes to get us into that sane awareness and calm, open receptivity that is required for our good to be realized, our prayer to be heard and responded to, so to speak. Now we're told that uh, we don't need to tell our, um, we don't need to show up at a honeydew list and we don't need to, you know, rhyme off everything that we need and everything that's wrong with us and what God has to do to make it better and fix it and mend it and heal it and so on. Because before we ask, we are given to. Before we even know what we need ourselves, it's already known in life, in the universal essential presence of it all. It's already known, so there's no need for us to spell it out. When you show up with a list, know this. When you show a list of needs, all you're telling yourself, and it's a beautiful thing, because it tells yourself this, everything you're not willing to let go of, that's what your list is. All of the stuff and things that you're not willing yet to let go of, that you have not let go of. And letting go of a sense and sensibility that is fragmented, that is negative, is essential before we can enter into a state of prayerfulness. We have to take off our shoes, so to speak, the shoes of negativity, leave the shoes of negativity outside the door before we can enter in to that state of wholeness, which is godliness, of fullness, which is godliness, of uh, at one moment, which is godliness, because only God can be in God and nothing else. Only God can enter in to God. Only good can enter in to good. So if we leave all our stuff and nonsense outside, if we want to be realized in prayer, we can't be like the monkeys, the monkeys that were for some reason having to be saved from I don't know what, I can't remember the circumstances, whether it was from overpopulation or poachers or whatever, and people had to go in and rescue some of these monkeys. And how did they do it? They got very heavy glass bottles, and into the very heavy glass bottles they put beautiful sweet-smelling nuts. And all the monkeys who found a bottle stuck their hand in and clasped those nuts. And then guess what? They couldn't get their hands out again because they wouldn't let go of the nuts. They wouldn't let go of the nuts. They could have taken their hand out if they'd only let go of the nuts. They wouldn't do it. So lo and behold, they came back the next morning and there was a monkey attached to every single bottle they had put down, <laughs> hanging on to those nuts for sheer life. You see, and you and I are just like those monkeys. We hang on to all of our stuff and we will not let go. We go into prayer and we pray. We start off, dear God, and in between dear God and amen, there's this crying, self-piteous lamentation and celebration of everything that's wrong in our world and everything that's not right with us. And then we come out of that and we say, I pray the whole night and nothing happened. No one responded to me. No, you didn't. And pray a whit during the night. What you did was you focused on all your ailments. And of course nothing happened except you feel worse for the concentration upon all of, all of that. I can't say in the sanctuary, all of that nonsense, <laughs> all of that rubbish, all of that garbage. That's what you got from dear God and all in between that to your amen. So that's not how we pray anymore if we want to get the business done. If we want to take care of our business, that's not how we pray. We let go of those sweet-smelling nuts for the better, for the more, for the greater. For the greater. And yet that's what we do. We go to counseling and our hand is in the bottle. We go into counseling, we get our counseling. We feel good at the end of it. Oh, that's good. I'm glad I came today. We get up and we pick up our bottle with us and we take it back out into the world. And that feeling good lasts for a few minutes and that's the end of it. So what we're saying here is we can't go into prayer clenched and closed off and shut down and tense, tense. We have the power over our minds and we have the power over our bodies. I want each and every one of us to say to our right hand now, raise yourself. Raise yourself. 
Put yourself down. You've just proven to yourself that you have power over your body. You have absolute power over your body. Well, if you can say, raise yourself to your hand, and it does, why can't you believe that you can say to yourself, heal, and you'll be healed? Why can't you believe the same, same way when it comes to healing yourself? When you know you have power over your body, because your body is affected by the way you think. Do you think for one minute that you can hang on to resentments and hatreds and have a healthy heart? Do you think for one moment you can keep sustaining bitterness and not find you have a sour stomach? Oh, take my word for it. Don't test it out. Just take my word for it in this situation. Don't test it out. Don't disturb your heart or your stomach when you don't have to. But understand the power has been given to you and not just a little bit of power. All power in heaven, in all of life, has been given to you that you can call on, that you can use for your good and the good of all else besides. It's given to you. It's with you right now. You can stop running out to Tom, Dick, Sheila, Mary, Penelope and Harry for this, that and the other. Why don't you run to yourself? Run to the power within yourself and feel like you believe that it's present. Think like you know it's going to respond to you on the affirmative side of life if you are affirming in your life and only if you are affirming in your life because what you expect is what you experience. What you believe is what happens. What you feel is expressed through you into your life. Why would it be any other way? You have proven this to yourself over and over and over and over again. Why can't we do it on the affirmative side when we do it so magnificently on the negative side? It's the same process. It's the same way. You think. You feel. You know. You state. You decree. You declare. And so it is. So, this week all of us are called to understand ourselves as this infinite intelligence with infinite potential for any good we so desire to be realized by means of each one of us when we come into cooperation with it on the affirmative side of life. You're brilliant. Each one in here is a genius. Let the genius out. Set your people free. Your people being your thoughts. Stop staying in your encampment outside of your desired kingdom. Leave the encampment and go into the kingdom and claim your sovereign throne. It's the throne of consciousness. It's the will of the heart. It's the feeling of the soul. And that combined is creating for you a life that is unstoppable, a life that is without limit, a life that has no restriction. And remember this, anything you bind yourself to, and you bind yourself to persons, places, and things through resentments, bitterness, and judgments, you are bound to more, more closely than any marital relationship could bind two people desperately and truly in love. You are, uh, Emmett Fox brings that on home. It says that will bind you in such a way that you are walking around with that all of the time and that is stopping you and blocking you from your good. What is it going to be? Do you want to live life free? Do you want to live life with a sense of zest and a sense of celebration and a sense of expectancy of great good all of the time? Do you want to make every day a day of celebration? Do you want to live in your own life healthy and well, prosperous, creative, successful, achieving, accomplishing your purpose for which you came here and making the contribution that you came here to make? Do you want that? I mean, is that what you really want? Are you going to stay stuck? Are you going to stay attached? Are you going to keep your hand in the bottle of your negativity forever and a day? 
and use everything else around you to excuse yourself from the fact that you have chosen not to let go of those sweet smelling nuts in that jar. Oh, that is to give your birthright up for a mess of pottage or a few sweet nuts. I am knowing that someone in this room now is ready for transformation. I am knowing that someone in this room is ready to catch the consciousness of what it is to be an aspect of an infinite intelligence that has the power to be in charge and control of his, her own life. I am knowing someone is going to go out through that door, not anything like the way they came in out of victimhood into a sense of overcoming and conquering and consequently becoming a victor. Who would like to be that one person? Is there anybody here? <laughs> All right, say with me now. Right where I am. Exactly as I am. Something great. Something powerful. Something awesome, Something awesome is ready to emerge by means of me. And I'm saying yes to it. Because right where I am, God is. And where God is, all is well. And so it is.